friends, welcome to episode 263 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast is something for you. I'm so excited to be sharing with you not one but two voice recordings sent in by past guests on the show. I believe Steve Tatro holds the record for the most appearances on the podcast. If you haven't already, I highly recommend you subscribe to his podcast, the School Librarian Learning Network Podcast, where he interviews school librarians who share their favorite lessons, ideas, and resources. I'll be sure to put a link in today's show notes. Hey there, folks. It's Steve from New Jersey, and I have got a purchase that I regret. So I have been trying to get more book stands from my library space because we just didn't have, we started with zero. And so we needed some. So I was looking for a nice, inexpensive alternative to what was out there so that I could find the cheapest thing and get the most and have the most book stands and most book displays, because that's what I was really going for. Lots and lots and lots of book displays on a limited budget. So I went and I bought a bunch of wire book stands. And I am so sad that I spent money on wire book stands. They do not do a good job, especially with paperback books. And I've got a lot of paperbacks in my collection. So I've got a lot of books that will not stand upright even when they're on the stands. It's a real bummer. I wish that I could trade them in for something that was solid. I love a nice solid plastic, solid acrylic stand. I've even got some plywood that I really like the look of. They're not as awesome as acrylic, but hey, you got to take what you can get. And anything I'm going to say is better than wire. I'll use them in a pinch, but man, they are just not great. I don't understand why people even buy them. So if you've got good reasons, maybe you can fill me in. But man, I regret buying my wire book stands. Sarah Smith has been on the show twice for episode 100 and episode 200. She is the creator of the fantastic graphic library website where she shares out all her many reviews so you can select and purchase graphic novels and manga with confidence. See the link in today's show notes. Hi, everybody. It's Sarah Smith, the district librarian from Central California. You might remember me from episodes 100 and 200. And I have a purchases I regret story from my early days of collecting manga and graphic novels. So I did make mistakes once upon a time. I'm not perfect. But I did not always know to pay attention super detailed to what comes in the different sets that are available to us to be able to purchase So I made a big, huge mistake when I was trying to order Naruto. (laughs) So I I ordered Naruto box set number one. And then I saw that uh, Follett had a Naruto set that I ordered. And I did not pay attention clearly enough to realize that it it contained uh, volumes 1 through 42, which was the same volumes that were in box set number one. So when my order came, I had two copies of volumes 1 through 42. But because I'm a completionist in that order, I also said my kids deserve the whole of Naruto. So I had <laughs> volumes 43 through 72 as well. So yeah, that's a lot of Naruto on the shelves in that library. There's two copies of volumes 1 through 42. So please pay attention to the volumes that are contained in sets um, when uh, publishers and when vendors are trying to help you out and make sets. The other thing is to pay attention to what issues are contained in uh, collected editions in comic books. So the difference between like hardcovers and paperbacks and collected editions and all that kind of stuff check out what issues are there and, you know, what copyright or what years are on the issues. So if it says like Batman number one, 
it should say like Batman number one, 2023, because there's a lot of Batman number ones. So what year did that come out? Because I've oftentimes made the mistake of, you know, switching between like a hardcover and a paperback, like what's available, but it doesn't, it's not always the transition is not always easy. You can't just go from the hardcover volume two to the paperback of volume three. You might have duplicate issues or you might have a gap between what is the last issue of the hardcover versus what was the first issue in your paperback. So it's going to frustrate your readers if you don't have all the issues that they need to continue the story or if they're reading duplicates. Um, And you definitely don't want to waste your precious budget dollars buying the same comic book over and over again because it's in hardcovers, trades, collected editions, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, just look at the contents. Make sure that you're not just purchasing over and over again. Check out what volumes are in your sets. And good luck with all of your graphic library purchases. Friends, I hope you consider sending in your voice messages to schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. Your recording will be included in the very next episode. See 24 prompts and the instructions in today's show notes. Amanda Jones's upcoming book, That Librarian, will be available starting on August 27th, but you can pre-order your copy now. And if you use the indie bookseller Cavalier House Books in Amanda's hometown of Denham Springs, Louisiana, you'll get a signed copy. I've included a link in today's show notes. When you look at the cover of Amanda's book, you might recognize the Freedom Fighter shirt that she's wearing. She reached out to the designer, Christy, who then designed a line of That Librarian apparel, as well as That Librarian flair, such as a bag, sticker, and mug. I love that we can all be That Librarian who advocates for our library and our students' access to books every day. You'll find a link to this online store in our show notes. 15% of the proceeds go to the Texas Library Association, as that is the home state of the designer. I learned last week that the book that I had hoped to use for our next book club episode, Jared Amato's Just Read It, has been delayed. It is now expected to be released in late April. Stay tuned as I will provide an update once this book becomes available to everyone. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United. On Threads, you can find me at School Librarians United. And on Blue Sky at SLU Podcast or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Be sure to listen to episode 224. I announce a sponsorship with Literati Book Fairs. And now is a chance to hear from one of Literati's Book Fair veterans, Kathy. Kathy Edwards, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful you're here because you have hosted several Literati Book Fairs. And, you know, there's probably somebody listening out there who hasn't hosted a Literati Book Fair. Would you give us an idea of how you schedule your students to visit that really has optimized this visit and being able to allow families to plan what they're going to to spend at the book fair? Definitely. So I always ask to get my book fair the Wednesday before my Monday start so I can set it up in an afternoon. And that's literally all it takes, an afternoon. We have teachers sign up for preview, a 10-minute preview slot that Thursday and Friday leading up to the book fair. The kids get to walk through. They have little clipboards. They make their wish list. They write down how much those items cost, and then they take those slips with them when they leave the library, and they put them in their book bags, and hopefully they make it home. Sometimes they'll go on our Monday folders with our really awesome teachers. And prior to that, the teachers have already signed up for a book fair shopping day and it usually coincides with whatever day they come to the library to check out books their checkout time that week will be their book fair time and so we can start communicating a couple weeks in advance hey families your kids teachers are shopping at the book fair on monday make sure you bring your money or go online and make your gift card purchase and be ready for your kids to shop on monday Well, I love it because it it sounds like if the families aren't comfortable sending cash with their students, 
that there's a way that they can authorize spending for their students when they get to the book fair. There is. It's a gift card system, and it's tremendous. The parents can print something out that the kids can take in. And if some of our precious littles who are very forgetful or lose things, there is a way for me, the book fair coordinator, to look up their name and see, oh, they have $20 to spend, and I can put that in on the cash register. Um, It works perfectly. It's been great. I'm going to guess that you don't need to call customer service a great deal, but can you share with us a little bit about what that experience is like? The experience has been great, and I have had to call them a few times. I had an issue setting up the register and configuring it, and even though the directions were right in front of my face, I chose not to read them and, and called the the customer service and they answered and they were prompt and they were cheerful and when I when they took me through the process I was like I finally noticed that I had the directions and I was like I had the directions the whole time and they're like you sure did but it's okay we were happy to help you like we could laugh about it I've had to call for some restock they if they couldn't answer I got a phone call I would say within 10-15 minutes like I didn't have to wait very long Um, I wasn't waiting a whole day or anything like that for the problem to be resolved. Emails are efficient. If you can't call, you can email. There's all, and there's always someone watching your book fair. Like they're watching what's happening behind the scenes and seeing what books are being sold and already sending in restock. I even had the vice president of sales. She came and visited my book fair. So she lives in Georgia. Oh, Barb. That's amazing. Yes. I've met Barb. Yes. It's pretty awesome. I got to spend the afternoon with her. She was great. She got to see kids shopping and looking for stuff. And what was kind of interesting, she came later on in the week. And so some of my things were looking a little, uh, I think she came like Wednesday. She knew my parent night was going to be Thursday. And she noticed that like some of the school supplies, like the really the catchy items and stuff were very, very short on supply. The next day I had restocks galore, like the next day. I love it. That sounds fantastic. Well, well, it does make sense. You've got book fair set up for the next two school years. I <laughs> sure do. Can't wait. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. It was my pleasure. Friends, tune in to learn all about Literati and their very generous offer. Librarians who book their very first Literati book fair and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team to see if you qualify. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 6. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive eBooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and eBooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode, let's roll RPGs in our libraries and my conversation with Lucas Maxwell. Lucas Maxwell, welcome back to the podcast. Amy, uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you. You know, listeners who are meeting you for the first time... And we, you and I have crossed paths several times. Would yeah. you introduce yourself? Would you tell us about the library you work in? Tell us about the grades you support? Sure. And a little bit about your programs, because today we're going to deep dive about one of them. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I'm the, I'm the librarian at a, at a high school in uh, in the South London, UK, in a place called Sutton. The name is Glenthorne High School, and I've been there about 10 years now, which I can't believe. Uh, the age range in that school, they call it a high school, because they don't really have junior high, middle middle schools here in the UK, um, they call high school for basically ages 11 to 19. So it, for me, coming from rural Canada, it's a massive school. It's got um, about 80, close to 1,800 kids, which again, for me is big. I work in the library with one colleague and together we kind of run 
all the different programs, and um, which, of course, the standard book clubs. Uh, we, of course, have manga, comic book clubs. Uh, we do open mics. It's very, very busy. And, of course, um, a Dungeons & Dragons club, which in the past, I would say, two to three years has kind of morphed and exploded in popularity that I never kind of expected. Um, yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> Lots of different things, but yeah, we try to we try to just meet the needs of our. We have a very diverse uh, student body uh, from all over the world, uh, which is a bit amazing. Uh, just me personally, to be honest, uh, again coming from like a rural Canadian kind of background, and to come into South London where there's a huge mix of uh, cultures, religions, and things that I never experienced before. So finding uh, programs and events and activities, books, of course, that that mirror their experiences has been um, a lot of fun and also a, a big challenge. But yeah, that's basically what we do. <laughs> well, and friends, I'm going to tell you what, this is the fourth episode that <laughs> Lucas has generously agreed to to be on the show. And I, I'm so grateful because, friends, I've learned so much about what Lucas does day in and day out because he has been so generous in sharing we have episodes linked in the show notes, episode 107, Fighting Fake News, episode 132, Raising the Profile of the Library and the Librarian, and episode 161, Teaching Teens. And I, I encourage you, to, if you haven't listened to all of those, you should, because there are a, a plethora of programs and ways that Lucas has created this absolute, like, hold on this school in terms of the value that you bring to everybody. And, and it really is fun. I, I, you and I cross paths on social media. We'll make sure that all, everyone who is listening, if you haven't already included Lucas in your virtual PLN, you do. So let me ask you, you know, when it comes to as particularly raising the profile of the library and the librarian, you did something recently, which I, I'm hoping you will explain, because I think it touches upon so many things that make you an incredible asset to your school and to your, especially to your students. You took your students to the British Library for your role playing game. Is that correct? Yes, I'll try not. I'll try to. I'll try to condense this because I probably could do. We could do a whole episode just on this event, <laughs> but. Um... Uh, the British Library, I mean, I guess think of it like the Library of Congress or maybe the Smithsonian in many ways. It has not just, it has every printed book ever, every, every book ever printed in the UK. And it has also sound and artifacts and things like that. And they have this amazing exhibit that they, a temporary exhibit in their, in one of their areas, which is called um, Fantasy Realms of the Imagination. And when you go into it, it has all kinds of things. It has um, J.R.R. Tolkien's handwritten notes when he was writing Lord of the Rings. It has a little map that C.S. Lewis drew when he was first thinking of Narnia. It has all the costumes from the Dark Crystal. It has Studio Ghibli stuff. Um, it has one of the original costumes from uh, The Wizard of Oz. It has first um, uh, first editions of like uh, of Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein. Um, it has uh, this fairy map that is about eight feet long but was hand drawn in 1912 or something and it is unbelievable it has um all this stuff that makes up the fantasy kind of that we know that the fantasy world that um we know of it has a ton of terry pratchett stuff and things like that and um out of the blue i got an email from the a programming director from the british library saying, and we just talked about this off mic, but, or off, uh, uh, yeah, off mic, uh, which, uh, she said she found an article I'd written on, on, uh, on the website book riot about Dungeons and Dragons and how it has helped the students. Would our students be interested in running a program there? Cut to five months later, we spent five months working on it. Our students who were ages 17 and 18, um, just a small group of them, about eight of them created a homemade Dungeons and Dragons adventure aimed for neurodiverse youth. And for the first time ever in the history of the British Library, we ran a program, three different stations set up. We ran a three-hour Dungeons & Dragons session open to the public. They had to book it. It was all free, but they had to book it. They completely booked solid in one day. They played for three hours past. They closed the British Library exhibit just for them. And I mean, it was kind of like overwhelming and for me and emotional well, to see the. <laughs> The stu our students running a session for neurodiverse youth in and amongst Tolkien stuff that, that without Tolkien, there would be no D&D, &D, in my opinion, and things like that. So it was amazing. Yeah. So and it just did that on the on February 12th. We ran that and they want to do some more in the future, some more work because she said it 
with change. It has changed the way they're going to view programming at the families because they that's what they were trying to do, like encourage more families to come. Because in the past, it's been kind of more of a research haven, which is it's an amazing space. It's absolutely stunning. But they are trying to attract more families, and this was um, a colossal success. So, so, yeah, that's basically what it was. It was very surreal, and I was just happy to help to be a part of it, like help set it up. It, it was one of those things that felt like Every, so many moving parts. I didn't know how it, it fought. It just all came together. It was worked perfectly. It was unbelievable to me. Well, and friends, I strongly encourage, because if you'd like to get more details, <laughs> uh, you turned around and, and posted a wonderful blog on your school website. Oh, thanks. And friends, I've linked it in the show notes. You posted it on Valentine's Day and goes into great detail. And I was absolutely enthralled. And, you know, it really does give us a window into what you are willing to do to create unique programming that really does support groups of your students in a way that that really allows them to grow as young people. So I'm, I'm so excited that you're here today. You mentioned you write for Book Riot. Friends, I stopped counting at 100 articles. Lucas has been writing for Book Riot since May of 2016. I'm guessing you've written more than a 150 articles for them. As somebody who is absolutely stymied by the act of writing, seriously, Lucas, you are unstoppable, an absolute writing machine. And so, friends, when I was able to get a copy of Lucas's Let's Roll book, I knew that there was an episode in our future. So when it comes to, to Book Riot, you've had this for a long time. Do you have a list of articles you want? Do they reach out and, and ask you for content? How does this all work? Because I know that you have been working with them for a long time. It, it has evolved over time. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I'll I take your word for it that I've done 150 or whatever. Because, uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. No, no, that I've, uh, that's really nice that you looked. <laughs> you took this time to do that. Um I yes, how it works is you can pitch ideas basically. Um, and over the last year or two, I've been pitching a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stuff because I want a for many reasons. Um, they seem to enjoy it, which is great. But also, I've I'm seeing all of these great benefits for the students and the teens and youth that I'm running it with. I want to. I'm very keen to keep track of everything and. Book Riot's actually been a, a, in a unique way, just a, a great way to for me to keep track of it. I do write about it on my own website, but um, Book Riot kind of gives it an extra push because they have a big audience and uh, it's great to get it out there. Yeah, so essentially, yeah, it's really simple. I, I kind of pitch a couple of ideas. We all get to every month and then they'll say, yep, do this or don't, or wait wait for this month. And yeah, it's really, it's really been really relaxed and straightforward, to be honest. <music> Love it, and you, you've truly found a, found a home with them. I yeah. am sure they're very grateful, and so <laughs> are your readers. So friends, again, a link in the show notes. I do have to say, I love interviewing other podcasters. So Lucas is a podcaster. He has a show, The Portable Magic Dispenser, which, which you sort of vacillate between offering library lessons, and then you also have a, on the same feed, you should have been a meat shield, which I learned is a reference to your role-playing games, which you also uh, broadcast. You know, can you give us an idea of how podcasting fits into your busy schedule? Yeah, I mean the the, the portable magic dispenser is a take on um, uh, Stephen King saying that books are uniquely portable magic, and I just thought it was a funny thing to say, and I just. I did, couldn't think of a name and it's really quick it's only 25 minutes a week and it's really just here's what i've done this week in the library uh that has worked or hasn't worked and i was quite honest on there and it's just usually me sometimes i have guests but very rarely it's not as as cool as yours trust me it's very it's, sometimes it's me just rambling and i go back and i edit i have to chop it up but it's literally 25 minutes and the idea of just to give maybe someone on a drive to work or something, a librarian, uh, just maybe, oh, there's an idea that uh, that I might try today. And that's really all it is because I'm always looking for new ideas personally to try in the library. I'm constantly looking for new ways to reach the students. And 
if it can help, it's amazing. And then the meat shield one is, um, it's me and three. It, it, it wasn't intended to be anything other than a one-time thing. And it, now we were well over a year in. Um, so I, I thought it'd be cool to record myself as the dungeon master and three uh, authors, actually four authors to begin with. And I just literally, I don't know what I was thinking. I just put it on Twitter when tw it was called Twitter. And I just said, does any, are any authors interested in playing Dungeons and Dragons for a one-time thing? I'll record it. And I immediately got some feedback and I just said, yep, yeah, I don't, I didn't know these people. It could have been a complete nightmare to be honest, because if you do that kind of thing, you don't know who you're getting. I had heard of some of the authors. I didn't know any, the other, some of them, um, but now what it's become is it's myself and an author named Alex uh, Fawkes, and she is a UK author who writes the Rules for Vampires series, which is perfect for 9 to 11 if you like vampires and, and amazing illustrations and just really cool. It's a funny kind of vampire um, uh, thriller. It's really, really good. And then Alex Dunn, who's an Irish writer who actually lives in Toronto, Canada, and she writes, um, her book is called The Book of Secrets and the Harp of Power, the sequel to it, and it's... Um, uh, it's a fantasy adventure mixed with Irish folklore and mythology. It's really cool. It's kind of like la very, very similar to the first one, uh, uh, very reminiscent of the movie Labyrinth, where they uh, it's like uh, creatures from the Feywild come and kidnap children, and they have to go in and save them. It's really cool. And then the third one is uh, Grania O'Brien, and she is an Irish author who has written a picture book about the uh, love letter to the, her home city of Limerick. And she is uh, she's going to be a huge voice in the young adult uh, literature industry. So uh, watch out for that. But um, we have been together a year now, and that's a long story short. Yeah, the Meat Shield title came from a student who stood up and screamed it at another student. You should have been a Meat Shield when they were like uh, yelling. <laughs> and uh, I just thought it was hilarious. Um, but that, and it's just evolved into this really fun thing that we do every week and we still record it and I put it out, try to put it out as quick as I can, but it is like a four hour session between me and these three authors who've just become friends and we over, uh, online, uh, D and D play. <laughs> Uh, I understand that there are other programs out there where people record themselves playing, uh, you know, these role playing games and, and recording it and it, it, it turns into video games and all sorts of, you know, they get optioned for movies. It's, it's a, it's a whole world. Forgive me. It is. It's a whole world. You know, today we're going to focus on your book. Let's roll a guide to setting up tabletop role-playing games for your school or public library. As somebody who has zero understanding uh, when it comes to role-playing games, I really did appreciate that you assumed no prior knowledge on the part of your reader when it came to understanding this book and then implementing what you've the suggestions you've made into practice. It, you really did write it for somebody like me who needs a little bit of hand-holding. Yeah, I mean, it came about because I, I'm always, I don't, stop talking about D and D on, uh, on social media. And I was getting a lot of emails and, um, DMS from other teachers and librarians saying, how do you run it? Like, how does it work? I don't know anything about it. And I thought I just not really, I couldn't really see anything out there for someone, a, who works in a school or, or public library or whatever. And, uh, also someone who has zero knowledge, like even the, even the starter set, which is amazing, assumes a certain amount of knowledge. <laughs> And I was thinking, what if they just knew nothing, um, like absolutely nothing? And there, because when I started it again, because uh, when I was a teenager playing it a bit, um, the rules were very, very different to what they are now. So, and I just happened to see Facet uh, Publishing, which is the ALA editions in the U.S., um, put out this kind of call for you know, pitch us an idea. It was on social media somewhere, and I, just, I, I literally. I had no clue. I just pitched it. Uh, no clue what I was doing. It hadn't written a. I hadn't written one word. And I said, "What do you think of this?" And the, and the gentleman, uh, uh, the amazing man, Peter Peter Baker, emailed me um, right back and uh, saw that he loved it. We had a meeting and it just kind of steamrolled from there and turned into this really cool book. So. I had so much fun going through it, and I realized it really will walk you through every step of the way. Um, and, and yet it does so in a way that is reassuring and at no point 
ever ridiculed me for not catching on to this uh, a long time ago. I, I love that you put the glossary in the front. And I know that, that that I have to imagine that was an active decision on somebody's part because it's unusual, at least in my experience. But I'm grateful because it did, you know, it forced me to at least go through the abbreviations because all of a sudden a great deal more made sense to me because I had at least had a chance to sort of take a look at the the terminology and the abbreviations. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that was uh, my uh, decision to do that and modeled by hope to do that just because, uh, again, assuming zero knowledge, there's a ton of terminology, acronyms, uh, different phrases that people assume people know. And um, there's still ones that I'm learning, even the four or five years in, I still, I'm still learning some things. So um, yeah, that was <laughs> just something I decided I wanted to do just to, again, the whole idea is just like to help help someone who doesn't know anything just kind of like dive right in and, and get started because I think that's the biggest barrier is this kind of feeling that where do I even start? <laughs> well, and again, as somebody who knows nothing, uh, I felt more than capable. I could turn around and start a club next week and feel like I was at least not making major mistakes in purchasing, that I could inch my way into this and do so with a certain level of confidence. Over the past 10 years, you've run other clubs in your school library. And friends, again, do make sure that you listen to Lucas's other episodes because he goes into a great deal of detail in explaining how he has, in, in this case, raised the profile of the library and the librarian But what makes role-playing games different in your observation? What I noticed immediately was that you can run, in any kind of school librarian, I think would hopefully would agree, like you can run lots of different programs in the school library and uh, people come and go, um, people drop out of programs, they may come this time and not come again. This group that I started with when they were uh, 12 years old, I'm with basically the same group now, and they're 18, 17, 18. They have not missed a session really for that many years. And when we were in lockdown here in the UK, which was, which everyone's uh, remembering that, uh, we were in severe lockdown. And we were playing every day over, um, over Microsoft Teams, which is what we were using as a school system. And just complete what they call, I guess, theater of the mind. mentioned the lockdown and and many people now in hindsight point to that time during which so many of our students were alienated and they lost touch with their friends so you know give us just an understanding first of all i know in great britain your lockdown it felt like to me lasted longer than other parts of western europe and and certainly lasted longer than than parts of the United States. It was a very conservative uh, lockdown, but your students were going to your your D and D sessions every day. So when we did the lockdown in our school, our students were still fully expected to uh, spend uh, five lessons a day online, uh, doing five periods of school, and that was just what the head teacher said. This is what's going to happen. Um, every single student was sent home a laptop if, or students who needed one. Say we're not like a private school or uh, there are government state, what they call state school here in the UK, a public school. Um, but uh, they were able to do that. It was amazing. Um, but they were in there like in the UK, uh, a public school, they still wear a school uniform. And so they had that they were in school uniform on camera in front of a teacher. And then they would shut the stop the lesson, go to the next lesson, join the next team saying, um, I was running online library lessons just like a normal day uh, from home, or I would also go into the library and run them alone, online in an empty library, um, which was surreal and weird. On days where I had the D&D club, which was basically every day, I had to like, I was clearing with the parents because I was I was very aware that, okay, there's, <laughs> they should have a break <laughs> from this online stuff. Uh, they should go out, you know, if we were really told only go outside for exercise is what we were told as well. Like you weren't even supposed to go out to walk your dogs and stuff very much. It was very strict here um, at the very beginning, but they were desperate to play because we had started playing and then we went into lockdown. We had been playing for a while and they were, they were desperate to, uh, to keep going. 
cleared it with the pairs, cleared it with uh, my managers. And so I would just make a new teams, like a regular <laughs> schedule off, like a real lesson, like a real class, but it was called this called TNT invite the group in. It was complete theater of the mind where they were, I was explaining what was happening. I would project maps and stuff. We had no cameras on at that time. It just made it runs faster. And uh, we rolled dice. Uh, I just, they had dice. Uh, I made sure get, they had their own dice from home and they were, um, we would roll online. So, um, but we played every single day. And what I was doing was, um, I was, cause it was all this, cause it was such a relief and it was such a relief for me, really. Uh, I could tell that they, it was a complete, it's complete escapism. They were, um, uh, it's a safe place. They can be themselves. Uh, no one's, uh, the, everybody's on the same page, but I was writing really detailed notes, uh, throughout. Um, and I would send them notes, um, um, <laughs> at the end of each session, just like, this is what's happened just so they could go back. And then, um, at the end of that, I converted that into like a 250 page young adult novel that I just gave them. Like I just sent it to them. Like I made it like try to make it funny and stuff because they do so many funny things and they're really, really sharp, clever kids. And they, they're, they're, they become since they were 12. And like I said, now they're 17, 18, they become like super tight friends. Um, but they still, uh, like, like good friends do, they still bicker and argue, especially at the D and D table. And that turns into a really hilarious moment. So I was capturing all that and writing it down and like creating little, little chapters of what happened. I mean, it's not like, it's not going to get, it's not going to get published anywhere, but it was just something that they could keep as a reminder. Like this was a tough time for all of us. Uh, but here's look, look what we created out of this stuff. And since then, it's kind of steamrolled. But yeah, in lockdown, it was a huge, um, uh, for me, it was like mental health uh, therapy in many ways. I don't want to, I don't want to say that it is actual like replacing therapy or anything like that. But I do know I have talked to mental health professionals who, especially over lockdown in the US uh, or in um, throughout the pandemic, ha are using it as a form of therapy. Uh, to help people express emotions and things like that. And I have seen just as an armchair, <laughs> and as, as an unqualified nobody, uh, you know, mental health wise seeing I can, it's clear the impact it was having. So that helped with writing this book because I was taking a lot of notes at the time because I had nothing else to do. So um, yeah, uh, long story short. <laughs> Well, but I, I have to give you all the credit in the world. And I'm telling you right now, I, I know I'm not alone when I say on behalf of most American educators, um, <laughs> number one, no uniforms required. Number two, we couldn't require cameras on. We, across the board, most districts that I connected with, the idea of having a camera on was incredibly not just intrusive and violation of privacy, but for some students, it was uh, a source of stress that people would see where they live. And so I'll be honest, uh, our dress code has, has gone a slippery slope since coming back from the pandemic because we've never recovered. We've, uh, the, the, the bedroom slippers, the flannel pajama bottoms, and the oversized sweatshirts, because apparently we're just, that's how we prefer to learn. And I'm not just pointing at the students. I, I'm... <laughs> Uh, you know, so I, I got to ask you, Lucas, one only need look at the title of chapter one to know that the author of this book is, in fact, a school librarian. Chapter one, convincing the powers that be. Friends, here is a true educator who recognizes that at the end of the day, this isn't going to happen unless you have your administration on board. So, you know, I got to tell you, you provided, you know, a fantastic nine selling points for why this is an incredibly impactful program that schools should be offering to their students. You've touched upon mental health and well-being, but I'm sure, like uh, myself, I was surprised at some of these just because in my ignorance, I didn't realize just how profoundly these role-playing games pull upon our students' skill set and, and encourage them to build them. Uh, absolutely. So, um, I mean, there's many, many things. I'll, I'll try to focus on a few of the, uh, the bigger ones. So we talked about uh, the mental health aspect, but um, uh, if you're thinking about when you're dealing, when you're working with younger kids, um, the first thing I stress and I talk about a lot in the book is that 
um, this is not a player versus player bracket PVP environment. We're not against each other. We're working together. Even me as the DM, uh, when I work with adults or play with, with adults, um, I'm cheering them on. My, my role is to present them with this world and they interact within the world. So I get that out of their heads immediately. And I always tell them there's plenty of games out there you can play that, that do this kind of thing, um, PVP style. Um, so we're not doing that today. Uh, younger kids, they want that kind of, some of them want that kind of environment and they want the, they like the combat, which is fine. But what it does is teaches you uh, empathy in many ways, because your goal, you, the success of your team is your success. So at a young age, you're teaching them through this, this weird and wonderful game that uh, a, you need to listen, uh, take your time. You learn, they learn like basic things like turn taking when they're, when they're younger and stuff like that, you're not talking over each other. Um, uh, and they're, but they become really invested in the other person's story. Um, and which is interesting because there's the other person's story and the other person's actions ha affects the entire group. And the group is trying really hard to succeed overall and find things out. If you build it up as a mystery, um, the other thing that it promotes is, uh, I mean, from a librarian's perspective, uh, reading for pleasure. So I've talked again, a lot about this um uh in other places as well because I, I find it really fascinating that if you were like right now if i was to take one of the a lot of the student society who play the D, D game not maybe not well probably in my group and in the younger groups that have kind of evolved from it and you took them aside now and said what do you think about what's your just opinion about reading they probably a lot of them would say i don't i don't care about it but like i'm not they don't consider themselves quote unquote readers but i guarantee you they are in the library every single day pouring over these rule books writing backstories for these characters creating characters rolling dice they like to create characters for fun and not they're not just create they're not just rolling dice they are writing stories about where they came from um and things like that so um it, it, they are reading constantly it's like been this kind of like gorilla style way for me to get these kids to read and it's been um it's been amazing to see so they learn that they learn um uh they they learn of course teamwork and they learn all sorts of the of skills that um that are uh that are important in life are, are able to uh to are encapsulated entirely in this game and when they the other thing that i notice is that when they they, they are approaching the table they can especially during the pandemic they were expressing their kind of fears and anxieties through their characters and one particular student who if uh, they were they found this abandoned village and i knew that they were having a bad day just because their wizard character just wanted to um, basically fireball every abandoned house that they found and they if that's something that they wanted to do let them do it. I noticed the other players uh, would describe how their characters were going up and hugging the character, even though they're just sitting there not doing anything. They would say, Mo, my character is hugging your character. And they were expressing this. Uh, <laughs> I could see their friendship circle being created in front of in real time. It's a very surreal thing. And it, it was very, um, has made a huge impact on me. And that's why, again, like, that's why I was like, I have to like capture this somehow <laughs> and write it down. So I was writing stuff down constantly. I got to tell you, friends, you are going to want to make sure you make it all the way to the end of the book because the the last chapter are all the resources. And when Lucas says they, they're pouring over these books, he is generously included in the in his resources in the book lists of, of books that not only support you as the adult who is organizing this uh, this program, but also the support materials that your students would then want to be reading. And then also many of, am I right, the, the fantasy books that would have really nice tie-ins with some of these storylines, and, and especially when it comes to character creation, because that is something for which I... I have no no prior knowledge of, but I, I appreciate that that our students get to create this alter ego, which I'm sure is very revealing to you as the game master to see what kinds of things they choose for themselves and and how it really would provide a window into what they might be be feeling at that current time. A hundred percent. Yeah, like I said, like we have um, students who, when they first kind of approach the table the D, D table 
they may, so when we go around to kind of like introduce ourselves at the beginning, I run like a session zero where I kind of go over all the things like, this is what, this is what this campaign, I try to run campaigns with them. Like, this is what this world is going to be. These are the things, this is what we're going to, without spoiling it, this is what kind of like what we're going to experience, just giving them a sense of it. Um, and we do like, there's a lot of safety tools you can do. Like they could hold up cards if they, um, they want to stop, you know, the game or pause the game and stuff like that, that can all happen. So th they are creating characters that are much more, uh, outgoing than they appear on surface, if that makes sense. So, uh, when they're in the game, everybody's there to play the game. So there's no, what I call like social barbed wire, where you have to navigate small talk or things like that. Everybody's there and they don't say anything other than they just jump in and they're there to play this game and become these characters. So that's all right uh, built in. So there's no, like I said, there's nothing stopping them from joining this group of people because they don't feel any judgments or, or anything for behaving in this way, in a certain way, uh, by incorporating their characters, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I love that it, it alleviates that sort of stressor and allows the kids the freedom to focus on the game and and not necessarily on the rules that govern their everyday outside of the game. Uh, you know, chapter two, you do something wonderful. You provide five case studies, and these are from the UK, Australia, and the United States, I believe. And, and it's wonderful because you pull upon the experiences of other librarians and what they have learned and are willing to share with your readers in your book and be a part of this. So I love when you you bring in those voices as well. Can I ask what you did to pick those five people and what especially was important that you glean from their experience as a, a librarian running a role-playing game in their programs? Oh, yeah. I mean, my idea was to get um, as wide a berth as possible. Um, and really, they were um, some of the people, one of them is a public librarian in the, in the Chicago area, uh, the Australian and some of it from, from the UK, etc. And my idea was to see, like, how do they have any barriers, really? That was where I was really um, wondering. And I was I was pleasantly surprised to say that most um, the, the management's uh, uh, the uh, you know or gatekeepers of if lack of for lack of a better term were pretty open to it, but I still wanted to write that first chapter because there are people who do contact me and say how do I that's why I wrote it really because I did have a lot of people saying how do I convince my manager that this is worth uh, doing um, so the idea that I what I gleaned from it was that uh, especially from um, a public library the public librarians who submitted their responses. Um, uh, what I learned mostly was uh, timings, if that makes sense. So uh, we had to, to running it in a school library is extremely um, is a challenge because I run a lot of them at lunchtime, which is only for which is for us uh, fifty minutes, which is a good long lunch, but it's not a long time to play D and D. So there are some things, and using those case studies, I was able to learn a lot about how oh how can I streamline my D D sessions to make it more fun engaging it so they get the, the they get the most out of it in that amount of time um so that's that was really i was looking for barriers and like uh, i quite selfishly like how could i improve my game <laughs> <laughs> wow i i think i know a little something about learning from other librarians um <laughs> yeah yeah i sort of like to check in with other librarians every week and find out what they're doing and see what i can you know incorporate into yeah. my space yeah i know a little something about that i, I, I think <laughs> yeah. I, I can relate it was a great chapter yeah. because i i love when <laughs> authors make room for other people's voices because it, it really yeah. does add to to our experience when we read the books in chapter three uh you provide a step-by-step -step instructions purchasing recommendations and options to host virtually. You've given us an idea of how you did that. I appreciate this as as a somebody who who comes into this with with no prior knowledge. I, I imagine so much of this for you is second nature, but for somebody like myself, I'd be starting from scratch. Yes. What I was trying to do for that chapter is essentially take away the again the there's a lot of a lot of people are asking me, what do you need? You really don't need that much. Uh, <laughs> you need the dice are the main thing. Paper, pencils, tables, chairs, and people, of course. So that's really all you need. You don't need the fancy maps or the miniatures. Yes, they look cool, but in a 
public and school library, uh, A, they, they are very costly. Dungeons and Dragons is amazing, but it is also extremely expensive. Um, and uh, it is a, like it's been a life changing kind of game for me, but it does cost a lot of money. So uh, I would say you need the dice, uh, which you don't need a lot of, to be honest. Uh, the player's handbook is really, really useful, but there's a condensed version called the starter set. So that was my idea that um, that's all you really need. And the other thing that I wanted to stress in the book is that. The game is there, the game is set up, it's really difficult to articulate it, but the, mis making a mistake as a dungeon master doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if you didn't get the right, uh, you don't need to know, like, there's so many rules, quote unquote rules. I've been doing it for five years, which in, in, the, in the relative sense is a very, very short time. There's so much I don't know, and it doesn't matter, because you can easily, A, you can look it up, you can pause, but B... The game is designed, it's essentially improvisation with dice and with you know, with magic and, and swords and stuff. It's it's set up so, um, there, that's why that's why this, I think students and myself and everyone kind of loves it, is that there are no real life uh, consequences. And failure is often, the f is often the best thing because if you as the dungeon master describe something hilarious that happens if you fail, which you which is made by when you roll that twenty sided dice, if you roll a one, that's considered a critical failure. It is the most. It can be the funniest thing in the world. Or if you do the opposite, it can be the most exciting thing for some of the players. So, uh, so that is kind of like what I was trying to get across with that chapter. Really, is that don't stress the smallest things because it doesn't matter. It it really doesn't matter. You can learn it as you go. But if you make a mistake, who cares? Because if everyone's having fun at the table, it doesn't matter if you've if you've um, screwed up the uh, the number of uh, hit points that a giant centipede has. <laughs> Whatever, yeah, it doesn't matter. It makes no difference as long as they're having fun. I think now is a good time to mention, and this is a little off topic, but it isn't. This past fall, the New York Times did a spectacular piece called The Dungeons and Dragons Players of Death Row. I've included a link in the show notes. There are visuals. It is an absolutely compelling read because when you recognize the importance that this game took on with the players for whom there was a great deal of certainty and uncertainty in how long they were going to, to be on death row. The certainty was they weren't getting off of death row. The uncertainty was how long they were going to be there. The reason why I included it in the show notes is because it provides not only an absolutely damning picture of uh, the criminal justice system in the United States, but it also speaks to just how incredibly escapist this game can be for for those who have nowhere to go and and I I loved re and I loved what made me think about it is when you talk about improvising and 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 making making you know changes on the fly imagine being on death row and and running a D&D &D game when you're not allowed to have things like dice um so it, it was an absolutely amazing story i included it in in the show notes because there are some visuals i believe you can see in there but it shows a lot of the diagrams and the worlds that they created and uh, for somebody who is looking to explore all the possibilities and why this role-playing games are, are spectacularly popular this is a, another way to another window into this world chapter four you offer up ways to engage with this game, both as a participant, as a game master, and with students being the game master. And I, I love that because I, I think in my personal uh, situation, I'd be far more comfortable. So I, I would be a host to this situation and, and at least for starters and, and provide the space and the time and definitely the snacks because you, you made sure that that was very important. Let's walk through a couple things. First of all, you do have table rules. And I think it's really helpful. You mentioned, first of all, PVP, no player versus player. Could you go through just your basic table rules that have evolved uh, since you have started this game at your school? 
Yeah, so the, the PVP one is number one. And the other one is that we're all here uh, to join a common goal, that I'm not their enemy or the D&D. The, the, there's a, like a misconception that the DM's job is to quote-unquote kill the characters, and that is um, couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, as I said, like with, I'm always cheering them on, yes, and presenting them challenges. If they make uh, mistakes, or not mistakes, but if they make certain decisions, <laughs> then yeah, then there, there's always consequences for their actions. So I learned that over the over the lockdown when they were playing, and again, this is when they were like, well, how old they would have been, 12, 13, uh, and they went into a city. And this is a city with rules and things like that. And I was trying to explain to them this, uh, and they were kind of at first being they uh, being very brazen with their behavior openly like treating the guards in a certain way and so two of them ended up being arrested and put into prison and i made it very clear like there are consequences to your actions so then they had to work this out <laughs> uh, so it's things like that it's just learn it's just them learning it's like explaining it like those are the rules like just keep in mind there are consequences uh, the other uh, uh, this could i'm not i don't know if this i'm sure other dms do this but um the the idea of it's very um It'll be, I don't mind really if they play with the dice, but if they're touching other people's dice, because the students bring bring their own dice and they like to have their dice. And if you're like invading someone's space and grabbing dice and spinning them and things like that, I always say, let's just leave everyone's stuff uh, alone. <laughs> um, um, that is a little, there's like a loose rule that I have. Um, and I always say, try to avoid um, cross table chat in between uh, your turn. We don't allow mobile phones or cell phones in our school. Um, so that doesn't happen. So that is another, um, that's a blessing at the D&D table because I've heard this from adults when they are trying to run a game with adults. When it's not someone's turn, you're explaining something as the dungeon master that might be quite important and you look out and three of them are just on their phones on whatever. That doesn't happen at our school just because of the, there's zero rule, zero tolerance for that. But So I don't have to worry about that. But the cross table chatter it's like we're going to be listening to my, me as the DM, but also we're going to be listening to each other and respecting each other's turn. What I've found, they know that there will be like in-game consequences, <laughs> and if they if they are paying attention, it's like, oh, we did pay attention. But they also know that uh, the other the younger groups that are running it are, are le they learn really fast that, like I said before, the other students' uh, success is their uh, success. So, uh, so those are the kind of table rules that I'm trying to uh, to uh, you know instill in them, and it's it's more, it's also about just being respectful uh, of other people. And I think once that is made clear that. They were not gonna that we don't we don't allow unless it calls for it in the story. So there was a situation where a student's player, uh, I just described, they were in this empty room and there was like this weird th uh, chair with these antlers, of really dark, scary stuff. And he's like, I'm gonna sit in it, and he had to roll the dice to see if the the chair cursed him, and he rolled terribly, so the chair did curse him. So he a spirit took over his body, and then he just attacked everybody. So in that story moment attacking each other was a allowed was part of the story that we were writing and then they had to investigate like where did this chair come from who's created it you know um but in the normal situation it's not allowed uh just because it isn't it isn't uh what you'll end up having is hurt feelings about the person who's been piled on or whatever and it's and it's just not fun so uh the idea of uh, of helping each other this is uh this is the game we're all in it together and that once they learn that me as the DM and the in the student DM, we I'm here to help you as well. Not I'm not here to kill you. That changes everything. <laughs> so yeah. Well, and I I will say I that was I you know I had a, some some laugh out loud and friends when you I, I I feel like I know Lucas after we've done a couple episodes together. <laughs> so I'm hearing the book in his voice, <laughs> and I hear this. And my favorite sentence is, "Your job is not to kill the players. Your job is to create a world full of danger and watch them succeed." Yeah. And I'm like, "Oh, that explains everything." <laughs> like I I now understand. I love this that you give us permission to embrace the chaos. Yeah. I feel like that should be cross-stitched in a pillow. <laughs> embrace the chaos. And, you know, you you said the players make the story. And, I, and that is no better demonstrated than you, you give this wonderful retelling and you don't need to do it now. But I'm just <laughs> going to tell you right now, friends, all Lucas said was, you see some birds. Oh, yeah. And... The whole like <laughs> yeah. I've got two pages of nothing but like what happens in the game when his when the kids playing with with Lucas see some birds in their airship 
and everything goes sideways. And and it's wonderful oh, yeah. because as somebody who has yeah. never been able to experience this firsthand, you give us a a a play by play, blow by blow of what happens when the this wonderful group of kids see some birds off the the port or the starboard side of their airship, and what happens? Yes. So you know it, it's wonderful because truly, until I was able to read about it, it didn't make sense. I mean, that's just a perfect example. Uh, thanks for reminding me of that as well. That's a perfect example of when failure is hilarious because they were, yes, they were yelling and screaming at each other. Like, what are you doing? This, that, but they were laughing, uh, falling off the chairs, laughing. Um, and that's the situation where you as a dungeon master are expecting them to go from A to B and all of a sudden something um, unbelievable is just sort of unfolded. Everything has fallen apart in front of you and you have no, I have no notes on now what to do. Um, they are lost in this forest and there's people after them and things like that. But Again, it just you can as a librarian, you know, I've read a million fantasy books and whatever. <laughs> it's, you can take from anything and just be like, okay, what's going to happen here? There's got to be, you know, you can you can think on your feet. But it's a, it's one of those situations. The other thing that I try to stress as well with the at the table is that it is a good idea before you start to give them, like I said, without spoiling it, give them an idea of the kind of threats and dangers that they may experience, and they can use those safety tools to like say you don't need to go into detail with a student and learn anything personal about them. But there's an example I heard. From from someone else, uh, it wasn't my experience, but another DM was talking about how they were playing with students and they were describing um, how they were falling from a great height, maybe from an airship like that. And for the for one particular student, again, it wasn't our students, but another student, that constituted a, a, a massive phobia slash fear that they had falling from a great height uh, or a plane crash type thing. Uh, so they held up the kind of X card, which meant I would like you to skip this now or like move on. Uh, and they, on and so they did, which is an amazing kind of tool. And on the on the, um, the flip side of that, if a student, let's say, has a has a really special interest or loves um, uh, frogs, and you are describing how they're plowing through a swamp full of frogs, they may hold up the green uh, go card, which just means I would like for you to like talk about this more. And uh, there's all these cool things you can do to help make the game more engaging, but also a lot safer for students who may have certain uh, challenges, fears, or experiences that they don't want to relive or, or experience in that moment. Well, and I can imagine, you know, this is, you talk about relationship building. You know, I talk with librarians every week about relationship building. My goodness, when you become the game master of the the D&D game, all of a sudden you have a very, very special relationship with these students because this is a, a committed relationship where you are going to meet every week, it sounds like, for a long time. You know, Chapter 5, as I mentioned before, is fantastic because it's chock full of resources. That's what librarians are really here for is all the resources that you provide. I was pleasantly surprised because, you know, this, you know, D&D may not be for me, but apparently you provided 20 other options, which can appeal to a very broad age range and a variety of time commitments. Because when you, you had those case studies and you had these librarians working with much younger students, apparently there are role-playing games which can appeal to, to students as young as, say, five and six and seven years old. And, and for me, I'm like, wow, well, that sounds like a wonderful way to get these students excited about this type of format. But you provide a very detailed list uh, of all those different, different options for role-playing games. We like our online resources. Librarians are always looking for those. And, you know, the, the recommended reading, because if you give me a shopping list, I trust you implicitly. I'm going to buy everything you tell me to buy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wyatt, thank you. Yeah, and there's a ton of great things like like you just mentioned. Like for the younger ones, there's ones like uh, No Thank You Evil. Everything's kind of built in. It's almost like um, it's a game where you play where the you have to like fill in the blanks. Where is it Mad Libs? Uh, oh yeah, Mad uh, Libs. Where you fill in the blank. It's basically D and D like that. Uh, you as the dungeon master read a little bit, and then or as the game master, and then the students or whoever fills it in for you, and they you create a story together. There's ones like uh, there's a My Little Pony D and D like RPG, which is for of course, much younger or those who don't want the the violence of it, the, the, because it is. I mean, D and D is a violent. There is violence, is, but you can, as the duck game master, you can you can avoid or you can. What you need to do is um, uh, find out what your players want. And not everyone's going to have the same interests, but um, like I found it with the adults that I play with that 
they actually they enjoy more like the exploration aspect of it they uh, rather than um the combat which can take a long time a combat scenario so i know that i'm going to incorporate that i know that a lot of my uh, i know which students of mine l enjoy puzzle solving riddle solving and combat uh role playing where they get to meet like a non-player character where i have to do like the silly voice and they have to interact and stuff like that so I, I make sure I'm incorporating all that stuff in, but um, there are tons of alternatives, like Kids on Bikes, which is like, uh, it's an RPG that's like Goonies. There's tons of them out there now, which are really cool. I wish I had more time to, to play them, but they're for, you can find them for any age, really. Well, and when you're looking for resources, the, the wonderful thing is you put them all in one place. Can I just ask, because I, I forgot to, to ask earlier, you know, obviously you've never had a problem selling this to your administrator, to your manager, to convince the powers that be that this is a valuable program. Have you ever been met with questions from concerned parents? <laughs> um, so I grew up in the middle of the satanic panic and I was told, because I was in Canada, and I was told that if I, when I was a kid, I was told explicitly that that game will cause me to commit suicide because there was this whole thing with like Judas Priest, the band was taken to court when I was uh, of a certain age. There was this thing on like 60 Minutes, I think, did a whole thing on it about how it's turning people to Satanism and stuff like that. And I think people actually in the in, a, in the U.S. went to prison for, um, for uh, I don't know what it was for, but it was something related to Satan worship around this stuff. No, the short answer is for me here in the UK, uh, A, my management, I'm extremely lucky. They just trust me explicitly to like, just, just, you know, I, I would say, I did say like, I'm, I'm going to just start running this. I would like to run this, you know, it's always been, yep, <laughs> go ahead. So I've been lucky that way. And the parent, the feedback from parents. So I ran a, um, so I decided to run like a, what I called it a Dungeons and Dragons convention. It's not really a convention. It wasn't a place where people just set up shop and sell things. Um, I just couldn't think of a better name for it. But I just created this thing where I I, I thought, what, what would happen? I just did it um, this year uh, in October. And I thought, what would happen if I if I set up shop in, a, in the library in the on a Saturday and asked a bunch of teachers and students to be dungeon masters and... We ran all ran the same session that that would run from 10 a.m. to like 3 p.m. Um, so over four and a half five hours in the library. So one table here, one table here, one table here, and in the end we had seven tables. And I just put it out there. I was like, I wrote a letter. I gave it to my line, my manager. I said, could I send this to all parents of the school? Maybe not thinking things through. I was just like, yeah, let's do it. And I had like 150 parents respond the next day. You know. And it was so oversubscribed and overbooked. So I had to like, I'm doing another one in a, to, to accommodate those people who couldn't get in. Because in the end, we had about a, just over 100 people in the library all playing the same D&D, &D, kind of what they call one shot from 10 to 2 on a Saturday. And teachers, tons of teachers coming in. The the the, the principal slash head teacher of the school came in to watch, uh, to watch it. To, to, they just wanted to experience, to see what was going on. And it was... Um, Really, again, like a truly cool moment where, again, everything came together. It was a lot of work, but I, I'm going to do another one. And again, you're getting the parents buy-in. Something that I became aware of when I was doing some of the background for this conversation, but when you did the British Library, didn't you have students writing the campaign? I, can, you, yeah, can you explain how that sort of works into uh, this, this type of a club? So we got... Some of the 17 slash 18 year old students are prolific kind of writers and illustrators. And they've really, like I said, in the last four or five years come out of their shells. And they not only wrote the entire three hour session, which was set in the British Library. So the idea of it was that um, the, at night in the British Library, so they immediately they, when we thought like, what can we do? That's what the British Library said. You guys, the, the person from the British Library knew nothing about Dungeons and Dragons. So she said, you guys are going to be, what can we do? And one girl, one of our students said, night at the museum. That's my idea. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Like what happens at night in the British library when the lights go out? All the characters from these amazing stories come to life. Um, the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz, uh, Alice, uh, Bilbo Baggins, on and on. But there's been, there's this creature that they call the bookworm with W-Y-R-M. Uh, it's like a, it's like a dragon slash worm that is uh, devouring 
the love of the the characters that we love, and the, and also sucking the love of storytelling from the British Library. And she and um, the other seven uh, kids, uh, they wrote this thing. It's pages and pages long. They drew all the uh, monsters and they drew all the uh, friendly. There's like a little squid. He's like a gnome. He's like a gnome squid. It's hard to describe him, but he's the he's the Janet. He's the gnome squid janitor named Quilbert, and they, she drew him, and he's like their helpful guide. He's got a little push broom in there. Uh, <laughs> so this has evolved. I mean, it's really one of the highlights of my career, to be honest, to watch that them from for five months uh, through exams and through all the stress that they're experiencing in, in high school as, as an older high school student. Every spare second coming to the library and us like, we created characters for the public to use to save time because we didn't have time for them to roll, make a character which can take over an hour. So the characters that they played were these kind of like characters that hadn't yet been eaten by the uh, the the bookworm, like Peter Pan playing a uh, a, a swashbuckler kind of rogue, and um, uh, the Tin Man was like a barbarian or something. Like all these stuff, all these classic characters, and the and the public when they when they were handed these sheets and they, some of them had no idea how to play D and D and some of them did. That's what the other thing is we had no clue who was coming other than it was aimed. It was a free program aimed at neurodiverse youth ages 11 up and their families. And we got some amazing people arrive and take part. And um, they had people like helping. So that was my job was to go around and anyone who didn't have a clue what was going on with D and D was to sit down and go, okay, this is what we're going to do. Don't worry. We wrote up like a little adventure summary Everything was written up for them. So the club, um, the club, had, it was kind of like the um, the pinnacle of the club, if that makes sense. Like the, everything that was positive and wholesome about that club came together in that moment at the British Library that night. It was really cool. Anyway. <laughs> Lucas Maxwell, you are so incredibly generous. Your, your students are incredibly <laughs> lucky. It Thank sounds you. like your staff adores you. <laughs> and, you know, I, I can't, I, you know, I, I have to imagine you have found new friends at the British Library. Yeah. And I, I, I expect at some point next year, I'm going to come knocking down your door and asking you to be on the show again. <laughs> you know, I, I'm so grateful for you taking time out of your busy day. And uh, please let listeners know where we can find you on social media because sure. I love crossing paths whenever we can. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, on social media, everything that on social media for me is just uh, at uh, Lucas, L-U-C-A-S, uh, J uh, Maxwell, uh, like Homer J. Simpson, Lucas J. Maxwell. <laughs> got it, got it. Uh, yeah, that's it. I really appreciate you um, giving me the chance to talk again on here. It's been really amazing. Thank you. I am so grateful. Listen, have a fantastic evening and a great rest of the school year. You too. Thank you. If you found this episode helpful, be sure to include Lucas in your PLN and tune into his podcast. And if you really enjoyed today's conversation, recommend this podcast to fellow librarians and be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. A couple friendly reminders, friends, use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more, and librarians who book their very first Literati Book Fair and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team to see if you qualify. Our next book club is on hold, but I'll be sure to post updates as soon as Jared Amato's book, Just Read It, becomes available. I'd love to feature your voice in next week's episode. Be sure to visit the link in today's show notes and learn how you can have your say by responding to one of the 24 prompts provided in the links. The topic of our next episode will be reimagining makerspaces and my conversation with Kate Abair. I hope you will tune in. <laughs>